Good afternoon, everyone. You are joining us for today's session on how to do a funded PhD in Europe with the support of an MSCA doctoral network fellowship. And we're just waiting to see how many people will join us today. We have quite a large group that had registered. So I hope everybody finds their way into our Zoom meeting today. It's a good afternoon. Someone from Hanoi, Ang Nguyen, is already joining us. Hello. Yeah, please do say hello in the chat so we know where you're from. Excellent. And uh, the opening today is done by my colleague, Dr. Jenny El Mako. So I'll hand over to Jenny. Thank you so much, Susan. So I can still see people trickling in. So Maybe I'll wait uh, for a few seconds. We are already live on Facebook. So for those of you who are joining us live on Facebook, welcome, welcome. We have an exciting panel for today. We are very, very excited because I think we, you know, this is a rich exchange. It's not just about uh, the MSCA, which of course is the, mo the, the main thing today, but uh, I love this uh, intergenerational and intersexual discussions as well. We learn a lot of things. So. Um, if you have friends uh, who, who are too shy to join us inside the Zoom room, um, we are live on Facebook. And uh, for those of your friends who don't have time to join us at the moment because they have other responsibilities or they are otherwise occupied, then we will be putting up the YouTube um, video on our YouTube channel, so you access ASEAN. So a lot of hellos here, give me a little bit of time to read through them. Susan already started, maybe from below. Uh, several people from Manila. Hello. I'm actually in Manila at the moment. Uh, still stuck here. I uh, have to make my way to Hanoi soon, but still here. <laughs> Hamza is from Kuala Lumpur. Hello. Uh, Ngok Bin Lu is from Kanto. Wow. I was just in uh, Kinyon. I hope, I hope I'm pronouncing that well. Um, Imdad is from Malaysia. Awal from Jakarta. Um, Susan was just there also a month ago or some, some, some days ago. Uh, Otik is from Indonesia. Hello, everyone. Um, so yes, um, we are going to start. So my name is Jen. Uh, I have my colleague here, uh, the ever indefatigable uh, Dr. Susan Renzavasu, and we have two guests with us here. So um, we are in a session on the Marisco Dobsity reactions. So as you know, the MSEA offer funding for PhD students to study across Europe. And this is a part of the European Commission's Horizon Europe research funding scheme. So there are so far about 25,000 PhDs have been funded under this scheme. And so this afternoon, we are going to learn more about it, um, how to apply, you know, what are the particulars, what do you need to prepare. Um, so we, we, you will hear that from, from our first speaker. Our second speaker um, will also catch that uh, with her vibrant uh, presentation on, on her being a fellow herself. So it's going to be an exciting hour or an hour, a little bit more than an hour, depending on how, it, how active you are, because we want you guys to really have these discussions also with, uh, with our speakers. So just a little bit about us. We are Euraxis ASEAN, Susan and I. Euraxis uh, is a project of the European Commission and its member states. Uh, it is a key instrument to foster researchers' mobility and cooperation worldwide. So for us here in the region, we host a community of about 25,000 or more now, scientists, researchers, research administrators, even people from business uh, who are interested in scientific collaboration. So we have been doing a lot of events, and this is just one of the events. Yesterday, we also had an event in the ASEAN EU uh, Expo. So if you, if I think some of you here uh, were there as well, because you said that you're going to join <laughs> today's session too. So welcome to you again. So um, in the next days, also, we have several events. So I need to flag that before we move forward. So tomorrow we have an open science event. The next day, we have a research collaboration event with ULIC and NASTA. Um, and then um, the next week, we will also have Meet My Lab. If you are from Thailand, uh, we also have a Falling Walls Lab face-to-face. Uh, -face. So um, just check it out. So we will send also information since you will be in our database already. 
Okay, so I think with that, I will give the floor to my colleague, Dr. Susan Ranzovasu, to introduce our speaker. Susan, the floor is yours. Sorry, <laughs> I couldn't unmute myself. Still the uh, little barriers of Zoom. Yes, uh, as Jenny said, today we have with us two fabulous speakers. Joining us from the European Commission is our colleague, Dr. Zuhail Luka. He uh, holds a PhD and is a policy officer for the Marie Skodowska Crew Reactions um, at the European Commission. So he is our expert, of course, to tell us all about the MSCA doctoral networks and how you can benefit from the opportunities there. And we have a second speaker, Jean Svensky Lichte, if I uh, pronounce that correctly. She is an early career researcher at the Zapiens Network Project at Lodz University of Technology in Poland. So very excited to hear about her um, experience and her advice, having gone to a country which probably uh, is, is one of the um, uh, still not so um, popular countries, if I may say so. So it'd be really interesting to hear her advice, how she experiences her PhD in Poland. So I hand over the floor to Sohail. Dr. Luca, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Suzanne, and thank you for calling me a fabulous speaker. I hope I will live up to these expectations. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, and hello from Brussels. It is nine o'clock here in the morning. Uh, so here we are just about to start the day. Uh, I'm very, very excited to talk to you uh, today about uh, the MSCA uh, fellowships. And I will now try to share my screen. Uh, share. Uh, we do this. I hope you see the presentation. Yes, we do. Maybe go on. Excellent. Yep, yeah. perfect. Perfect. Yes. And um, I would do this. So MSCA stands for the Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions. And um, they are mostly directed to the doctoral level and above those who want to make a, a PhD or uh, have to have a postdoctoral fellowships or uh, are engaged in research in general. But today we are going to focus on uh, the doctoral programs. So just to give you an idea about the bigger context of funding research in general in Europe, uh, this is funded through a budget that is renewed every seven years. So every seven years, the European Union publishes a budget of a sum of money that is dedicated to research and innovation in Europe. And um, every time they give it a different name. So the previous funding cycle was called Horizon 2020, which finished in 2020, and as of 2021 last year and until 2027, uh, there is a new budget cycle called Horizon Europe and with uh, the sum of uh, 95.5 billion euros for these seven years. Um, it is um, mainly divided into three pillars based on the emphasis. So pillar one, the emphasis, is on excellent science. Pillar two is thematic. So uh, health, um, uh, civil society, digital, uh, IT, climate, um, whatever. So the main theme is actually uh, topics. While pillar three, the main theme is innovation. And generally when we say innovation, there is a very strong link with the industry. Uh, the MSCA, is part of the excellent science pillar. And if we zoom into um, pillar one, uh, you see that uh, for MSCA, 6.6 .6 billion euros are dedicated 
into this funding cycle, all dedicated to uh, actions directed towards researchers. Then we zoom further on the types of action of MSCA. As I told you, it's not only for doing a PhD, but also after the PhD, if you want to have a postdoctoral fellowship, also uh, there are programs for staff exchanges between institutions all over the world uh, that, that goes beyond researchers, even lab technicians or managers in a university or an institution, they can go to visits to other countries in another institutions to learn from each other. Um, but here I want to emphasize that within this budget of 6.6 .6 billion for MSCA, 50% of this, half of it, is dedicated to the doctoral networks, which is what I'm going to be talking to you about uh, today. But before that, you know, I, I want to tell you a little bit about the features. What are the principles that MSCA stand for? Um, because um, this is not, not only uh, a simple uh, fellowship program, but with the years, it became um, a brand, a symbol of um, principles in, um, in doctoral training that we believe in and that we stand for. Last year, we celebrated the 25th anniversary of MSCA. So with the years, um, the, the, this, this program has developed also a reputation and features and principles that when you mention the name MSCA, people associate these principles with the, with the program. What, what are these principles? Quickly, you know, I won't dwell on it for a long time, but uh, of course, there is the focus on, on researchers' training and skills. Uh, but also career development. These are uh, principles, of course, that are usually uh, present in most fellowship programs. Now, the only, the only uh, special parts here that within the skills, we put a strong emphasis on uh, what we call the transferable skills for researchers. That is, uh, yes, as a researcher, you have to have the technical mastery of doing uh, uh, that allow you to do your actual research. But also, we emphasize the trainings in the fields of, for instance, communication, intellectual property, uh, um, uh, entrepreneurship, uh, marketing, even. Um, uh, so, so that by the end of your doctoral uh, degree, you are very well rounded and ready to face the, the job market. Uh, also, with the, do you, during the, the degree, we ask the supervisor to, to have with you a career development plan, thinking about your future. And uh, we have it formalized. This is obligatory. They have to have work with you to do a career development plan. The second feature is also very interesting, which is that excellence is the main criterion for us, not the topic. We call this bottom up. Bottom up meaning that we don't, when we publish uh, a call, we don't specify uh, a field. We don't say that, okay, this is in chemistry or this is in biology, no. It is uh, open to all sciences, including of course, social sciences. Um, and that is also a big advantage of this uh, of this program. Um, it is very international, so it is open to all nationalities, and that's of course important for you to know. Um, um, we emphasize also what we call the structuring impact that uh, wherever uh, the research fellows are located, we hope that when they are done and they leave that the place where they are working will have also improved and acquired some of the principles uh, that are promoted by MSCA. And we always emphasize the strong collaboration with non-academia. Non-academia, it can be, yes, the industry, the private sector, but it can also be NGOs or charities or hospitals or whatever. Some, uh, a word on, on terminology. 
um, of the countries of the world. So uh, we divide the countries of the world into three categories. The EU member states, you know, the, 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 the members of the European Union, and a few countries like 10 or 12 or so that we call associated countries, countries associated to Horizon Europe, and they uh, basically um, pay fees to become uh, members uh, of the club of Horizon Europe, if you will, um, and by that they have uh, exact um, rights and obligations as EU member states. Then third countries meaning uh, the rest of the world, basically, any country that is not a member of the European Union. So, so that if these terms are mentioned uh, later on, you would know what they are. Another um, word on terminology, when you have contact with MSCA uh, at the beginning before applying, you could be an organization like a university or a research institute or an individual like uh, somebody who finished their master's or their bachelor and say, I want to make a PhD. I'm an, a person, an individual person. And here, the way to participate is different based on whether you are an organization or an individual researcher. Now, uh, today, I think that most of you are individual researchers, so we are going to focus on this. I'm a researcher who is looking forward to do a PhD. What do I do in order to benefit from the opportunities offered by MSCA in this field? As I mentioned before, um, there, you know, there are several rules, but, but uh, you know, some simple ones is that you can be of any nationality. So this is good news. Uh, the, the second is, that you always have to move. So uh, like if you are uh, you know, in, uh, in Bangkok, for instance, living there, you cannot get a fellowship to stay there. You must move, you must always move. That's where, because mobility is part of our principles as well. So as we said, we will assume that all of you are individuals uh, wanting uh, to do a PhD. So what do you have to be? You have to, um, to be uh, um, a, a doctoral candidate, meaning that you are registered in um, a, a university or a research institute to, to do your doctorate in a, Euro a European or associated country uh, institutions. Uh, there is no age restriction, no nationality restriction, and no topic restriction. Uh, so the, the restriction, as I mentioned, is this mobility uh, rule. You must move. Then you can tell me, okay, well, I mean, yes, I, I live in Bangkok, but I've been living there only for six months. So uh, would this be uh, my location, whatever? So the rule is that uh, if there is a place where you lived for a total of 12 months in the past 36 months, then yes, this would be considered your uh, place of, of residence. And then you need to move if you get uh, a fellowship. Now, our uh, doctoral networks have three types. Um, and um, you can you can choose any one. There is no earmarking of budget or quotas or anything, but it is to give more choices and more flexibility. There are the standard ones. The standard doctoral networks uh, is basically you. Uh, uh, there will be uh, a website that you know I will give you at the end uh, that is benefiting from our funding, and they advertise positions to do a classical PhD a doctoral uh, degree in their institution. Um, then we have uh, two special programs. Uh, one is called the industrial doctorate. And here it gives you the opportunity to have your doctorate done between an academic and a non-academic institution while having two supervisors, one supervisor from 
the academic and one supervisor from the non-academic institutions. So for example, you want uh, to do um, a doctorate in mechanical engineering. And you would think that, ah, it would be you know, a good idea that uh, I would spend half of my time doing my work in the university and half of the time doing the work perhaps in the research and development department of Siemens or BMW or whatever. And this uh, kind of doctorate, it gives you the possibility of spending 50% of your time uh, in the non-academic uh, sector. And you would have an advisor in that company, I mean, a, a supervisor and a supervisor in, um, in the university. And they jointly, jointly supervise you. So, of course, this uh, gives you a perspective uh, that you understand how things work in uh, the enterprises where perhaps in the future you'd be working. And, of course, it gives your degree a very important value when you finish your doctorate and you go and look for a job. So that's, that's one type. The second type is called the joint doctorate, where, again, you would have... Uh, common, you know, double supervision, but in two academic institutions, like you, you, you would be doing your doctorate actually in two different universities or research institutions, and your final diploma would have the names of two universities, not one. Uh, so it can be this, or they can give you actually two diplomas, one from each universities. So the advantage of this is that you would have really close collaboration and the diversity of the program. So you, you learn different things from different institutions. So these are the different types of doctoral degrees that you can apply for through MSE. Now, we get a little bit now into the details of this, uh, these fellowships, you know, how, how long are they, for instance? Now, they can be as short as three months, which is very rare. I mean, nobody usually asks for three months to do the doctorate, uh, and up to 36 months, which means three years. Um, they have a very nice feature called the secondments, meaning that uh, you start doing your, your fellowship, uh, you know, in, in Berlin, for instance, in Germany, uh, your doctorate, and uh, we give you the possibility that uh, you can uh, be seconded. That is, you go on a visit to another institution somewhere in Europe or in the world for up to one third of your fellowship. Uh, that is, if your fellowship is three years, you can go for up to one year to do some specific research or learn a technique uh, in a different uh, laboratory or, or, or university in a different country. So this is a nice feature that pro provides uh, great flexibility. And in fact, in, uh, in the industrial doctorate and the joint doctorate, the two special kinds I mentioned in the previous slide, this one third condition doesn't even apply. You can, you can have uh, secondments for as long as is needed or as long as your supervisors uh, advise you to do. Um, so, uh, I, as I mentioned before, in the industrial doctorate, uh, you must spend at least 50% of your time uh, in the non-academic sector, um, which, you know, I give the example of like Siemens and, and BMW or whatever, but also it can be in an NGO or a hospital, whatever. Important that it is non-academic. And um, the, all our fellowships put very strong emphasis on the transferable skills, as I mentioned, career development and supervision. So um, getting a bit in more details of the eligibility, you know, how do you know that you are actually eligible to apply? So it's a very important, uh, question from you know an operational standpoint. So, as I mentioned briefly, you must be already a doctoral candidate. That is, uh, you must be registered uh, for doing a doctorate. But of course, you should not be in a possession of a doctoral degree already. 
at the date of recruitment. Uh, and not only that you need to be registered to do a doctorate, you must be registered to do a doctoral program in at least one EU member state or an associated country. And in case of the joint doctorate, at least two of them, you have to be registered there. So you have to be registered in an EU member state or associated country, but you yourself can be from any nationality in the world. For the industrial doctorates, the candidate must spend 50% of the fellowships at the non-academic part, and I'm saying it for the third time. <laughs> um, and uh, I already mentioned the, the, the no restriction nationality and uh, the mobility rule that you must move. You cannot stay where you are. Um, I usually don't like to talk about money, but uh, still this, I think, is some useful information. Um, so um, uh, this is uh, the, the, the allowances for uh, each month, okay? That is, um, each person, each month, we have this allocation for it. These numbers are indicative because uh, it's usually multiplied by a factor based on the country in order to make it realistic for the cost of living. You cannot have a standard fixed figure for all countries, even though some countries are expensive, some countries are less expensive. So, okay, I mean, on the left column, you have, you know, basically a salary you know, basic salary, and then, you know, the, the some extra money you get because you moved country, so you need to rent a place. If you have a family, you get more. But I think what's, what's interesting are the second and the third column. Uh, you see this um, 1,600 euros in research, training, and networking. This money uh, are monthly, and you can use for going to conferences, to um, to uh, registering yourself in trainings, but also even some uh, materials uh, to use for your research. You know, it's, it's not it wouldn't be the main research funding because that's not enough. But you know, some bench you know bench materials or or, uh, or consumers or something like that. The last column, the one thousand two hundred euros, go to the institution where you are working, uh, which is the cost of of management. Uh, and the indirect cost. Uh, we publish calls for proposals once a year. So this is the calendar, you know, the uh, for I'm, I'm showing it for all actions, but you should look at doctoral networks, which is uh, the first one. Um, so um, so so um, uh, we just opened one um, last month. Um, and uh, these are calls uh, not for individuals, but for institutions to apply for together. And then once they get the funding, uh, it's them that advertise positions that you can apply for. Where can you apply for this? And the wonderful web portal called Your Access. And uh, you are going to get this presentation after uh, after the event so so don't worry about like writing down things uh, and links and so forth um and on this uh, all our fellowships must be published on this portal which means that if you stick to this portal you will not miss any of our doctoral positions because we make it as a legal obligation for institutions to publish any uh, msca post on this um, on this portal. So this this makes it a one-stop shop for you. Uh, it's very user-friendly. You, you know, you uh, click on the job, you click, you choose the MSCA, and then you will get a list of positions. You choose the one that matches your interest, uh, be it in the field or be it also in the country or the institutions, you know, like any, um, you know, like any job search, if you will. Um, so uh, you will see uh, when you get, uh, you know, uh, this presentation, you know, putting, all, you know, all the series of the useful links you might use. And with that said, uh, I um, hope I was not too slow or too fast 
and um, I, you know, I'll be very, very happy to take your questions when the question time comes. Thank you. Let me now unshare. Uh, uh, stop share. Okay, so um, I think I managed to stop sharing now and I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sohail, for this very um, detailed presentation. And uh, I'm just looking at our Q&A. We have already two questions for, from Inda and Aoife. And maybe I'll take uh, a minute or two, Sohail, to just raise these questions here before we turn the floor over to our next speaker who would uh, speak about her own personal experience. So there's probably a couple of questions. First of all, about the, um, the eligibility. You were mentioning that uh, interested candidates will have to be registered in Europe. Could you maybe elaborate a little bit on, uh, on that, what, what that exactly implies? Uh, yeah, so I mean, um, with or without fellowship, uh, when somebody, starts embarking on a PhD, they, uh, they try to get uh, admission. They try to get accepted in a research institute or a university uh, for, to be admitted to their doctoral program. Um, and uh, this step is needed before getting our fellowship. So, which means that in, in practice, uh, you know, any colleague in the audience who is interested will start, first of all, looking at various universities in their field, and probably they will know best because uh, they, are, they are experts in their fields, say, ah, oh, I know this, this university is good in what I'm doing. Uh, they will um, apply and perhaps contact the professor, say, you know, I would like to do a doctorate uh, in the university and, uh, you know, once I'm accepted, I will apply for an MSA uh, fellowship. And uh, of course, the, each university will have an administrative procedure on their website of how to, to get admitted. So that's uh, uh, in, 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 in practical terms, that's what it is. Thank you so much. So we have maybe a follow up question from Barbara Ilian. So she is wondering uh, whether she should start looking at the opportunities that are already advertised on the Euraxis jobs portal, because she has a supervisor, she has a thesis already, I guess a, a question, a research question, and she can register at a university in France. What would be her next step now to apply for the MSCA doctoral fellowship? Uh, okay, assuming of course that she has not yet defended her thesis, because if she has defended her, the her thesis, then she cannot apply. Uh, but right now, already, uh, she can go on your access and look for positions. Now, right now, uh, there probably will be a few, but then uh, the consortia that were, uh, that are, you know, got accepted now for the first call of last year, uh, they will start working and together in July, and then maybe by the autumn, there will be an avalanche of positions published. So it will go in waves about the quantity of, of uh, positions that one will find. But um, it could happen that to, already today, there would be some, uh, some positions, but uh, it goes in waves based on the dates of the calls. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you were to look at the website today, you already find quite a sizable number of opportunities that are advertised by these doctoral networks or as they were previously called innovative training networks. So don't get confused. The commission has just changed the name for this very successful program. But as we've heard, uh, depending on when those consortia of universities um, finalize their program, they will then advertise a new round of open positions. So it's always a good idea to maybe once a week, uh, take a look at the website and see what's coming up. And Jenny and I actually have a, um, a database of key contacts and we're sending you 
um, an email every so often in once or, or twice per month and we advertise specifically these opportunities in the doctoral network so with your permission also we will add you to our database so you will get that information on time now a couple more questions uh, this of course always refers to the eligibility criteria in terms of the academic credentials of the applicant. So someone is asking they're in the first year of their master's um, program and they haven't finished yet. Can they already apply? Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, like having finished the master's is not a requirement. What is required is that a university uh, will have admitted you to their doctoral program. Exactly. Um, another question comes to the uh, other credentials. For example, do, do you think a successful candidate must have already a publication record, or what other skills are the uh, the the doctoral network coordinators looking for in a successful candidate? What would be your advice on the election process? that uh, that people can maybe fine tune their CV a little bit to make sure that they are successful with their application. But listen, this, um, this I cannot help very much. Why? Because they are actually uh, chosen uh, not by the EU, but by the institutions that received money from the EU to provide these fellowships. And uh, the selection criteria will vary very, very much depending on the field. Uh, so um, that is, um, you know, especially like, for instance, you know, uh, if you think about social sciences and compare this to chemistry or engineering, um, uh, you know, uh, for instance, in, you know, in chemistry or engineering, you know, if, if the applicant has had maybe um, a short internship in a, in a laboratory or in a company or something, it will make a good impression. Uh, while in, in social sciences, sciences uh, it will be like, you know, maybe uh, somebody was part of the poetry society in the university, you know. So it is really completely up, uh, up to them. Uh, um, but all I can say is that there is not a formal requirement of publications or any actually CV related aspects imposed by uh, the, the MSC as, as, a, um, uh, as, as, as an action coming from the EU. So it will be like uh, the normal criteria that would apply to somebody, you know, uh, um, trying to get a job or trying to get a, you know, a, a, a candidacy for uh, for PhD. Yes, thank you. I think this is a very good point. So the the funding body, the European Commission, is not the one that is collecting selecting the uh, the candidates, but it is the consortium members, and they, uh, as we said, this is a little bit like applying for a normal job. So the position that uh, is advertised will list a certain number of criteria that the candidates need to fulfill. And as we've heard from Dr. Sohail, that depends very much on the scientific discipline that you will be in. So this kind of replies to all the questions that I see now coming in, uh, referring to your GDP, etc. Sorry, your GPD, not your GDP, uh, referring to your particular situation. So you need to, and I'm sure our next speaker will emphasize that as well, you need to study the advertisement very carefully and cross-reference yourself. Is this the pro does your profile match the profile that is advertised um, on the website? And then of course you need to tailor your application to ensure that the committee sees this is the person that we need for that particular PhD opportunity. Now, uh, I think before we continue with the question, because there's a lot of questions, and I think if we just maybe first invite our second speaker to share a little bit about her experience, how she went about identifying the position, applying for it, and how she's experiencing her past so far. I'm sure she will touch on some of these questions. And then we can get back to everything that's coming in in the chat and the Q&A after her presentation. So Jean, please, the floor is yours. Yes. Can you hear my voice? I'm, I'm really sorry because I have like a sore throat uh, at the moment, but I hope that 
um, my voice is good enough. <laughs> okay, let me share my uh, screen firstly. Um, can you see in a in a full page? Okay, all right. So thank you for inviting me and good morning from Utrecht. I'm currently in Netherlands now. My name is John Svenske Lichter. I'm a PhD student in management and quality studies. I'm based in Poland, uh, to be more specific in which uh, University of Technology. And I'm a Marie Curie uh, fellow for PhD uh, program. Uh, the name is Sapiens Network Project. So if you see my screen now and you're a little bit curious what ESR 14s are and what, what ESR 14 is and what Sapiens Network Project is, I'm going to explain to you. But let's go a little bit about my background. I'm Indonesian, as I said, that I'm living in Poland at the moment. So I obtained my bachelor studies in industrial engineering at University of Fasanuddin in Makassar in Indonesia. And after that, I work as a mining analyst for Caterpillar Indonesia. So it's still related to my, like the job was still related to my uh, bachelor background for four years. I worked there approximately. And then after that, I decided that I want. I decided that I want to continue my master's degree, and I got uh, admitted for a program for Erasmus Mundus Joint Master's Degree in Logistic and Supply Chain Management. So I had opportunity to live and to study in three different countries. I did my first semester in Barcelona in Spain, and then I moved for my second semester in Riga in Latvia. And my third semester and also my defense I obtained from uh, Berlin in Germany. And like when I finished my master's degree, I realized that I really love like academia. I, don't, I didn't want to go back to um, professional uh, career uh, anymore. So that's why I continue to work and jump into academic life. And I work as an industrial engineering lecturer. Uh, at Sampurna University in Indonesia, and I worked there for two years. And I decided that, ah, this is not enough. I want to go further. So I tried to apply to several PhD, and then I got rejected as well. And then um, I found this a uh, very good opportunity to apply for Sapiens and Talk Project, and I applied. I think I saw the advertisement on Euractus. It was back last year in March 2021. And then I, I start um, submitted the application. I followed the procedure for the interview. And uh, yeah, it was just like one interview at that moment. It was in April, uh, which is one after uh, my submissions. And then I got a guy, I got admitted in May. So because I've I've seen uh, some questions uh, about this, so like the process is actually like really fast. It's just like um, less than uh, two months until I got admitted. Uh, I got accepted in May two thousand and twenty one, and the project start in September last uh, last year. So uh, for, yeah, as I told you, like what's exactly Sapiens Network is. So this is like the acronyms for uh, my Marie Curie project. It's Sustainability Procurement and International European and National System. So this is like our umbrella project. So we are um, 15 PhDs there. So our job is basically related to procurement or I would to be, to be more specific is public procurement, but we are like, we also have like our specific, um, our specific project. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my own project um, in the next slide, but I really want to share you this demographic because I always got the question, uh, got, uh, uh, got asked like, People always think that um, if you ever heard about Marie Curie project, it's always dominated by uh, students or PhD uh, who focusing on like uh, natural science or for example, like engineering and technology. But as you can see in, uh, in my slide or in my demographic, like we are actually like very diverse in terms of origin. Is the thing the thing is just like we in my group like I don't have representative from Africa but yeah we also have from America um not north and south and also from Asia 
And as you can see as well, actually we are dominated by female, not by male. And this is also like quite interesting because like almost half of my um, colleagues that work as a, uh, for this uh, PhD project as actually like they are dominated by low. And we also have three uh, people uh, with a background from economics, management, and business, and two persons from engineering, including myself. And there is like one with a background from political science. So we are 15 in total, and we known, uh, we've been known as early stage researchers or PhDs. And we are supervised and co-supervised by 20 professors in 10 universities. So like we are 15 uh, PhD, we are like um, studied in different universities and in like 10 consortiums in total. But we not only work uh, with the university because there, there are also like 20 partner organizations that uh, work within our project. And if you think that this project like only involves like countries or organizations within the European Union, uh, the answer is no, because we are like expanding our networking, even like among those 20 partner organizations, we have one in Iceland and we have also one, uh, George, uh, George Washington University in the United States where three of uh, our ESRs will go there to also like conduct their research. So that's a very big opportunity anyway. And here's a little bit more about my specific uh, project. I'm ESR 14 or e early state uh, researchers number 14. I or I always made a joke like I'm agent number 14. So as I told you, like the umbrella project that we are going to work uh, about uh, something related to public procurement, but my project itself is focused on the product, which is textile. And because uh, this is related to public procurement, so it's more about like how to um, develop the circular economy or like reuse and recycling procedure for textile product that use in public sector. So I work with the military uniform and also like a lot of textile product that use in health industry, for example, like bed sheet in the hospital. So basically, yeah, textile that we use in public sectors. And as it has been mentioned before by Dr. Sohail that you're not going only to do your research in your PA, in your uh, home university, you're going to be uh, in a high mobility scenario for your research and it is called a second man. So I will do my second man as well to another universities and also another partner, um, partner organization, which like it has been designed since the beginning. So when you apply or when you see the, the advertisement uh, on your access, you will see the descriptions. Like for example, like I apply for this position ESR 14 and it has been uh, explained when I apply that I will be located during my research in Copenhagen. For example, the first one, I will be conduct my research about uh, theoretical and historical model of textile. And I'll be joining uh, the Center of Textile Research at the University of Copenhagen. And that's also where uh, the base of my co-supervisor. So I don't, I not only have like uh, my, my supervisor from my home university, but I also have my co-supervisor. And, and that's not only me, I mean like, all 15 ESRs, like we have like supervisor and co-supervisor. And this is also like a plus point because I've seen also like a lot of questions asking about like how to find your uh how to find your supervisor, like how to contact your even like co-supervisors. But the thing is when you apply for the positions, everything has been set. Like the your home university and your secondment, and also like your uh, professor and co-supervisor in another university. So basically it's already set. The thing that you have to do is just like only to apply for. And that's for the university. And after that, I'm going to work with, uh, with two partner organizations. The first one is Fair Trade Advocacy Office. This is in Belgium. Well, I will uh, uh, learn about the research about 
the recycling uh, military uniform because they also work together with uh, Dutch Ministry of Defense. And the last one is Islay Association. This is uh, like organization for sustainability. They are based in France, but actually they have like a lot of um, project in collaboration with uh, other countries in the European Union. So instead of going to uh, Bordeaux in France, I will be relocated in Austria, in Vienna, where I will also learn about military uniform with Austrian uh, military services there. And this is basically, you can choose or you can plan all together with your supervisor and co-supervisors when you want to start and where you want to start at first. So it doesn't have to be like, um, it's like stick. You can uh, design your own research just because everything it has been said, like, no, you, you can start first with your uh, partner organization or you can start first with your, a course supervisor in another university and that's that's fine for my case because uh my first year is really full with the training i also want to share you the experience later on so basically this second man i'm i'm going to start uh, doing it in my second year which is i will be in copenhagen in august this year and in belgium i will do next year in february and for Austria with um, in Vienna, I will be there in September next year. And maybe you always hear that PhD is, is such a very lonely journey. You will basically like work alone. Nobody will be there to help you and to support you. But the thing is for our project, we always try to develop any possibilities with another uh, ESR to develop synergies to best. So basically, as you can see that we come from very different background and we are like very diverse. So we try to find the synergies, like how can we work each other uh, from different perspective to like um, uh, produce like one research. So this is also my synergies, as you can see, like the other ESR, they also have um, like specific project, for example, like ESR 12, they work specifically for climate change and I will work with her because uh, when we speak about textile, there are like a lot of um, negative impact for the environmental and also with gender equality and to be, to expand our research, I will also will work for uh, ESR 2 that's focusing on global supply chain. So actually like you will learn a lot, you will, um, I always made a job that your brain will be explode because at the same time, you have a lot of things to learn about, but at the same time, like you're really excited because like the door is actually open very wide to you. Um, you can learn a lot of things uh, from this uh, project. <clears throat> and this is uh, some documentations from my activities, but this is uh, more specific um, activities related to a uh, Sapiens Network project. So as I said before, like my first year, like we are busy with trainings. So ATC is basically uh, stands for advanced training course. So our first years we met uh, more often, we have like a course related to public procurement, but not only, uh, so we try together or to have the same understanding about uh, public procurement, but we learn it from different perspective, for example, like, from low perspective and also from economics and business perspective. So it's like, basically, even though we came from different background, we have the same fundamental understanding. And that's uh, the objective of doing a lot of trainings during our first year. And we basically move a lot, as you can see, which I start in September and only three weeks uh, after I start, I went to Italy for uh, where we met for the very first time all together with the, all ESRs or um, supervisors and also co-supervisors. And then in December, we do the same, uh, another, another training in Belgium. And most of them, uh, I mean, like the location is actually like, um, the the universities where other ESR is based on. 
And in Rome, it was in April when we uh, had our very first project meeting. So the purpose to meeting uh, frequently is not only like to have training, to have the same understanding, but also where we have to like uh, present our project uh, every six months just to make sure that even though we came with, we are in different universities and every university is like, have different procedure and different method to treat their um their PhD students, but at least in the in in the umbrella of Sapiens Theater, we uh, still progresses for our project. So we present our uh, progress meeting in Italy um in April, and just last week ago I was in Sweden um to also present uh, my research to the representative of the European Union. And yeah, this is uh, the picture right, right after our presentations. But I mean, like the, and after that, as you can see, there are still like a lot of, um, the, a lot of uh, plan for my, for my movement for, uh, related to Sapiens Network. So basically I'm fully booked until January, 2025, but actually like, like moving or traveling is not always like related to Sapiens. I also had, um, uh, a lot of uh, opportunity to go to another country to be more specific with my own research. For example, I was in Belgium in April uh, to be in a textile uh, conference. So, I mean, like not only expanding your knowledge and also your experience with a Sapien Nestor, they also give you floor to explore your own research. So I went to textile conference in uh in Brussels and in now I'm in Utrecht uh yesterday just yesterday I uh had a workshop for my um a book chapter so this year I wrote uh, a book chapter and that's going to be my first publication during this PhD and it's expected to be published in December so we met all together in here to, I mean, like do some evaluation for our writing each other. And if you are proactive enough, your opportunity is even just not like that um, in, the, in the scope of your uh, Marie Curie project and also your research. Because actually, if you are, if you being um, MSCA fellow, you also, it means that you also have a very large opportunity to be involved in MCAA or Marie Curie Alumni Associations. And basically they also have a lot of uh, activities that you can involve. For example, like um, I was in Marie uh, MCAA annual conferences. So they had a conference, a conference uh, every, every year. And it was last March, uh, it was in March, um, this year in Lisbon in Portugal, where I had the opportunity to uh, meet Jenny in person. Uh, and I think three months, uh, not three months, sorry, like two or three, week, three weeks later, I also got invitation from European Commission to represent uh, MSCA from Poland for another conference in Leiden. Um, yeah, so I'll be back in uh, here in Netherlands in the next three weeks. So. It's, I mean, like, it's very, uh, it's, it's very wonderful. Like, I mean, like when I did my master's or before I did my master's, I was wondering like how lucky people that always like get paid, like to travel, moving from other places and other countries because they have to work, not because of a uh, holiday. And now, as you can see, like I have, um, a lot of opportunities, even some of my friends, they start feeling like, oh, I'm so tired of traveling. Can we just like stay at home and working from, from home? Because yeah, but at the same time, it's really nice to be here and there. And then you can meet people like um, sharing your experience, expanding your networking. And I believe this privilege is a, it's a huge experience that you will not gonna get it if, um, maybe you can get it, but not as much as if you are an MSCA fellow. 
So if you are interesting enough and you're getting like more curious, like how actually to be a part of MSCA fellow. So this is my personal experience about how to apply. As it's also um, explained by Dr. Sohal before. So I got I got my uh, I got the information about my about Sapiens Network also from Urexus. So and this is that was even not my very first experience uh, to apply for PhD. I got rejected for nine times before. So this is like my 10th attempt after I finally got accepted. But the point is you have to check the website frequently. I always get a questions like um, when the application is open or when the application is, is closed. So basically it depends on the project itself. Like some of my um, friends, like um, they are also like MSCA fellow would work for another project. Like they start the project in uh in january not in september for my case i start in september so basically the application is always open along the year depends on the project itself so all you have to do like checking it frequently at least like once in a week and the next tip is make sure you meet the requirement especially for the topic and host country it has been explained before as well and this is also related to my uh, personal experience because at the moment at that moment when i apply for my uh, for my Marie Curie project actually there are like two projects that really fit to my uh, to my background but the other one they will be based in Karlsruhe in germany and at that uh, and i used to live in germany for two years which is like you you're not allowed to live in the country where you're going to apply if you ever live there for more than 12 months so that's why i i apply for the position in poland and yeah maybe that's not popular as well but i believe that i'm in a very uh, proper place because uh poland especially which it has a very good research in textile. <clears throat> and this is the more important things because if you find another another applications in your access, like not Marie Curie, um, not Marie Curie project, normally they just ask you for CV and also like a motivation letter. Um, and that's like pretty easy to apply. But um, if you want to apply for Marie Curie, you have to write your proposals and like the time could be like really, really tight. For example, like my case, the the time between like the open application and the closed application is just like one month. And for my personal experience, I don't have experience in textile. I don't have also experience in public procurement. So I have extra effort like to uh, create a very, a very good um, proposal, like to get the, because that's going to be like, your uh, first attempt to get attention to your supervisor and co-supervisor by providing them with a very good proposal. And you cannot just do that in just like one or two days. For my case, it took like probably three weeks for me to prepare uh, for my proposal. And my tips is also ask the feedback. And remember that MSCA project like mostly uh, is interdisciplinary research for my, uh, for example, like my case, I'm, I have my background uh, to take engineering, but now I, I work with uh, lawyers and econ, so you have to extend your knowledge as well. So it's really good if you want, if you have the opportunity to ask feedback, not only from people that understand your background, but also ask the advice from people from different backgrounds. Like for me, I ask my friend, um, his background is chemistry, just to make sure that you write a very good proposals and even people from your different background can understand like what's, uh, what's the objective or what's your purpose uh, that makes you want to do this research or want, want you to join in this, uh, in this Mary Curie program. So yeah, that's the thing. Thank you very much. If you have more questions, I'm really, really open. You can reach me uh, on my LinkedIn or you can also check uh, the website of Sapiens Network Project where you can get the idea like how the partner universities or partner organization work together as well. And also like the diversity of the project. And you can also reach us on Instagram and also our community as the Mary Curie alumni.
So that's all from me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jean, for this really exciting presentation. And I think you've given us a really clear picture of what makes this opportunity so unique, that you're not just in one university in one country, but you're really moving around. You get uh, insight into not only the, the expertise, the scientific expertise of the different host institutions, but you meet a new network of people. You're building your own network, which you will, I guess, be able to exploit throughout your career as a researcher. So really fascinating. And as you said, the door is wide open to all of you. So really, really inspiring. And yes, I think you definitely need a little break after all the countries uh, you visited in just your first year. We have a, a lot of questions. And as you rightly said, Jean, a lot of people are asking, when are the calls opening? What is the application deadline? And as Jean has said, you must make it a priority for yourself to visit the Euraxis portal as frequently as possible. And I'm taking the liberty here just to quickly share my screen to show you what this portal looks like. This is the Euraxis portal. It has all kinds of information that are useful for you, but you are currently interested in the find jobs icon. And you would then, for example, look here for the European Research Program. You click on the Marie Skudowska Career Actions. Sorry, I need to move this here because uh, as we've heard at the beginning, the program has renamed itself in the last 18 months. So uh, it is known as Horizon Europe and has Horizon 2020, but click on anything that says MSCA and it will then spit out for you the opportunities that are available. And just for example, I just click on here the first one so you have an idea what this looks like. This is a PhD position within, as you can see, a training network, doctoral network called Copper Mix. You find that here all the uh, information related to that particular opportunity. Yeah? So just to emphasize what Dr. Sohail said earlier on, it's very individual. It depends on the particular PhD opening, what the, uh, the consortium is looking for. You find more information, but important for here at the top is where to apply, contact, um, and this is really all you need to know. So this is uh, a position in this case in, in France, and I think the deadline here is the 15th of July. So if by coincidence, this is someone in the audience who's interested uh, in this particular area, that would be an opportunity for you to apply. So just as both our presenters have said, you must make it a priority to check in the Euraxis portal very regularly and just see what's, what's come up. Jenny, you have your arm raised, so maybe I'll, I'll just give the floor to you. Yes, thank you, Susan. Yeah, I just wanted to say because yesterday we had a uh, discussion on the expo. Um, it, was, it was actually for, for the benefit of Jean and Soil and, and the rest of those who haven't attended, it was on how to do a successful PhD application. It's very important for you to note that um, in the in the EU, it's quite different from maybe from uh, from the PhD PhDs that are being done uh, in Asia or in North America, where you apply and then you know you have courses um, uh, for the first two years, you know, and then you become like a you know, you become part of a research group perhaps of the remaining of the years. Um, so in, in the EU, like in, in my case, I think it's the same also with Jean, you know, you are basically, it's, a, it's, a, it's also a job application. You are applying for a job, yeah? So you become part of a research group, you have particular responsibilities inside the research group. And so it varies. Um, in, in some cases, you, they require the motivation letter. Uh, in other cases as well, there, are, there is a specific application form that you use. So some, some um, get rejected, not because they're not good, but because they attach CVs when there are particular application forms that you have to submit. So, you know, um, these are particular uh, calls, uh, so uh, doctoral programs. So please be very careful to, uh, to really read the whole, the, the whole advertisement, you know, the whole ad, and then to respond accordingly to what is being asked because it varies really. The second thing is, um, now that you have attended one of our webinars, you will be part of 
um, of our database. And so we, Susan and I painstakingly, you know, tried to curate every two weeks, you know, a, a newsletter, a flash note for you uh, of, of opportunities uh, in MSCA and, you know, in, in, other, in other, other programs as well. So these are programs that are fit already for, uh, for Southeast Asia. So do take the time to click, <laughs> to click and then to open it up and then scroll up and then, you know, and find more information there. Thank you, Jenny. And we have a few minutes for questions. So maybe we just, just start from the bottom and work our way up and I'll direct them to either Jean or Sohail. So we have two questions. I think that we can put together here. I think this is for you, Jean. Uh, an anonymous participant is asking, first of all, whether you already had a research proposal before you applied. And secondly, the person would like to know whether as part of your research, you also do coursework. Oh, okay. So for the first questions, actually, this is that was my first attempt applying for PhD, like where I required to write a research proposal because uh, the one that I mentioned before, like I got rejected for nine applications. It's basically just like, uh, it's the same like a project but funded by the uh, by university, not by MS, uh, MSCA. And they just like ask for CV and also invitation letter, but I often got rejected. And I was wondering, if I got rejected, where, like how they can like see me, like uh, how can I get the attention, see my potential if it's just like um, CV and invitation later. So that's why I try to um, go further by uh, applying MCA where that was my first experience actually like uh, writing research proposal. So yeah, I've never had experience before. And for the second questions, well, actually, it depends on uh, your home university. But for my case, uh, for example, like my colleague, like uh, who, uh, who are with the uh, background of law, they basically don't have any course, uh, any courses for their PhD. So they just like um, do their research. For, but for my case, uh, I still have like mandatory like and also elective like PhD courses until my second year. But that's basically something like more related to my research, uh, which is like how to um, develop your research method, both qualitative and quantitative. So this is something like very specific, like um, something that you are going to, to put for sure in your um, dissertation. Thank you so much, Jean. So hi, here's a question for you. When I, I think showed the jobs portal just now, what also came up are the MSCA co-funds. So we have a question here. Uh, what is the difference between MSCA doctoral networks and MSCA co-fund? Uh, so for, for the purpose uh, of the audience, which is as you know, potential doctoral candidates, there is no difference. Uh, the difference is for the institutions that apply for it. But for you, what you will see at the end of the day is an advertisement on your access for a doctoral position, be it whether it's coming from CoFund or whether it's coming from the doctoral networks, for you, it's identical. So uh, for the purpose of this seminar, there is no difference. Uh, yeah. And maybe just let me say something while I have the microphone, because uh, I mean, listening to Jan, uh, I see uh, that we are managing to achieve something that we had it in our mind as, you know, as a strategy. And, and I want to impress on the audience uh, that this is something attractive, that listening to Jan's talk, you feel that we, that Europe, and we're trying to have it as a campus. It looks like one campus. Yeah, like, you know, you just get up in the morning, have a course in this country, and then have a training in this country. And of course, I'm exaggerating a bit, but this is, let's say, the long-term goal to have Europe as, as you know, um, like, yeah, like, like a campus, if you will. Um, so, um, I just wanted to mention this because it, it came to my mind when I was listening to uh, to Jean's talk. 
Yes, thank you so much. So as you said, at the end of the day, whether it's an innovative training network, a doctoral network or a co-fund network, you will be an MSCA fellow. Exactly. Obtaining your PhD exactly in what sounds a really absolutely fabulous environment, really setting you up for a, a stellar career as a researcher. Now we have a lot of questions, I think, that are relating to very specific uh, cases, and um, most of them have already been answered. Just for, uh, for your ease of mind, we will share, of course, the recording of the session today. And we will upload the slides of Dr. Sohail and with your permission, Jean, also your slides on our website. Jenny and I will send out an email alert to all of you that have joined us today so that you have time uh, at your own leisure to look at this again and uh, to identify the opportunity that fits you both. Maybe in a nutshell, it's a fabulous opportunity open to applicants of all nationalities. All scientific disciplines are covered. So our uh, attendees asking about English language, literature, social sciences, yes, you will also find an opportunity for you. You have to make sure to study the Euraxis website regularly because there is no set application deadline or opening date. You really have to ensure you're regularly updated. Jenny and I will make sure that we'll channel the information to you. And I think as Jean said, uh, you also have to uh, you have to have a little bit of stamina. You might not be successful the first time round. Do make sure that you, that you make use of the network that you already have. Get people to look at it. It's an, as we said, it's an interdisciplinary experience. You're not only becoming a, an expert in the scientific field that you're working on, but you're really going beyond. You're acquiring interdisciplinary skills that will set you up to, to become a PI and to go on and do great things. And maybe as a final um, appeal to you, do make sure you contact Jenny and myself. We are here in the region. Jenny is currently in the Philippines. I'm in Singapore. We're online everywhere. So we are basically your interlocutors and we can give you further advice. Also for those of you who have a message, they're trying to get in touch with supervisors and they're not responding. So perhaps Jenny and I can also assist you and give them uh, a little nudge. I'll hand back to Jenny. My, uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, to all of you for these wonderful questions. And as I said, please keep it going when we're offline and Jenny and I will support you as best as we can to make sure that you will join Jean soon and also have this fabulous experience. Thank you. Yeah, I also had a wonderful experience some years ago when I was also a uh, MSCA doctoral fellow. So Jean and I can, Certainly, you know, we are the testimonials. We, we enjoyed ourselves and that is why we, we are very happy to share also and make sure that all of you, 102 of you, will do the, the, the doctoral network with the MSCA. Uh, before, any, before I close this session, I, I will be in, in Bangkok um, in the next day. So if you're in Bangkok and would like to say hello, uh, maybe perhaps we can meet. We have a very active um, representative also of the Marie Curie Alumni Association, Nari Sorn, who is in Mahidol. So if you really are serious already of doing this MSCA and you have questions for us, um, we will be there in the next days. And with that, thank you so much to all of you. Have a good afternoon. So you'll have a good morning. And also to Jean, thank you so much. Susan, I'll see you around. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye and see you in Europe.